I just want to give you a little tour of the Meso controller that we have on this machine. Some of you may be interested in looking to buy it for yourself, so I just want to run you through some of the features and some of the reasons that we decided to make the transition to this style of controller. So what you get for your money is this 15 inch capacitive display. This is available with the touch model. It is installed into this plastic housing. The housing itself is hinged so you can reveal the aluminum backing plate and the controller system mounted on the inside. So this guy, you can buy this separately from the actual touchscreen. And it is your computer and your controller all built in. It has all the labeled inputs and outputs, your stepper motor connections, they're all right in here. It comes pre-installed onto this aluminum backing plate which has four mounting holes so you can mount it to your support of choice and these studs that you can install a Meso supplied relay system if you want to put the relays in here. We've chosen to put them in the control cabinet of the machine but other than that very simple. There's a decent amount of room in here to run your cabling. It's a little tight, they mounted it kind of high but you can still fit everything in there. It has a cutout in the bottom so you can get your cables in and some pre-installed switches and a USB extension that connects back to the USB port on the controller itself so you can connect your flash drive from the outside. With that closed, you see how small and nicely that's all packaged together. These buttons down here it comes with and they can be programmed for whatever. You can use them for cycle start, cycle stops, you got your e-stop there. All together in one very tidy little package. I do have a lot of very good things to say about this controller and if I had to pinpoint some of the things I dislike about it, it would be purely the price point. It is quite expensive for what it is, it kind of seems like they priced out all the components that this ultimately replaces, tacked on a convenience fee and that's what they decided to charge for it. And that strategy ultimately worked on us, it didn't make sense to nickel and dime on the controller when we were putting together pretty expensive machines anyway. I also dislike that they charge you extra for the 5-axis version over the 3-axis version. We have bought both styles and they both come with the provisions for the A and B axis. So it seems like just a software limitation when they sell you that 3-axis. They just remove the functionality of the two additional movements. And I feel like that's a little bit chintzy. Just give us all 5 if they're already going to be on the board. But they decided to charge extra for it. So we'll go over the layout a little bit here. They've done a really good job of breaking down the user interfaces into six individual categories, some of which you're going to use a lot, some of which you're never going to use, but they're all there. I like that they've broken that up so they're not overloading you with information in any one area. So on this jog and probing tab, we have some of the basic information for the machine. At the top, we have our time, Wi-Fi connectivity state, so if you're hooked up to Wi-Fi, it'll let you know, number of jobs you've run on this individual controller, you got your work offsets, and the firmware version for the controller itself. Right over here on the left side, we have a machine state, a door state, and an e-stop state. So when you first fire up the machine, you're gonna see this blinking yellow, indicating that you need to home the machine. Below that is the door state. We don't have a door sensor hooked up to this. If you did, that would indicate the door state and it can shut down the machine when somebody opens the door. And then below that we have the e-stop state. So if I press this button, we can see I've triggered that. It's letting me know that it's an alarm state. So basically, if all these are clear, you're good to go. Over here we have the workpiece zeros for the machine. So once you've set up exactly where your workpiece is, you zeroed it off. Those are the coordinates for that. The coordinate system for the machine itself is over here. And that's going to reset every time you home the machine. So when you first fire it up, it is going to prompt you for a homing sequence. When you do that, it's going to reset all the machine coordinates to zero. And it's going to remember your workpiece coordinates. So if you're using the same stock over and over again, it's not going to forget where those zeros are. You're just going to be able to home it and run. This also works really nicely for stopping an operation part of the way through. You can shut down the machine, come back to the next day, you can start it up again. After it's homed, you can just pick up where you left off. Works really good. It will depend on the quality of the homing sensors you're using. Ours are pretty accurate, so we have no problem picking up an operation even a day later. Over here we have the jogging controls for the machine. It's currently blinking that it is in the continuous mode state. So all that is, is I can just freely move everything around. It's not a problem. 
and I can adjust the feed rate of those moves down here. So we have this little slider with a percentage so I can turn it way up and I can move it fast. Or I can turn it way down and I can move it slow. If I'm doing some probing or touching off a surface or trying to get real close with the tool for whatever reason, I can go into step mode. And then my options down here are the increments of any individual step. You may be familiar with this if you used Mach 3 before. It has a similar type of feature. And then when I click the button, I'm set to one millimeter here. It's just gonna jog that machine one millimeter at a time. And I can dial that down all the way to a one hundredth of a millimeter. I can get some pretty precise moves. We have our three axis movements here, Y, X, and Z. And we have a probing option over here. So if we have a probe in the tool holder, we can go and touch off the corners in various locations of our stock. This works for squares and circles. So you can get the machine centered up over the material you're using. That's a really nice feature. We don't use that, but it is available. So the next page over is gonna be F2, our program and MDI. And this is where it's gonna display the operation we're currently running. You'll notice it leaves some of the other information alone. So you still have your machine coordinates. You have your workpiece coordinates and the machine states. So when it's running, it'll be running in this window. You have your cycle operations, your starts, your spindle stops, and all that kind of stuff right here. If the machine throws an alarm for any reason, it's gonna indicate here. If I press the stop, same as before, indicated there. So it shares some of the information of that previous screen, but this one is designed for running the program. So when I load my code, I'm gonna see all those code lines pop up here. A little graphic of what I'm milling, just from a bird's eye view perspective the lines of the movement, and then my options to start and move the machine around from here. I can turn my coolant on and off, I can start and stop my spindle, and a few other options. If I move over to the load file tab right at the back here, this is where I can load any code from the flash drive connected to the unit. So I would just go through here, I'm gonna load that guy, and I'm gonna see down here, it's telling me that it's loading the code and showing me what that operation looks like. So all the center lines of the tool movements, loads it, tells you what the travel lengths of any movement are. And then once it's 100% loaded, it takes a little bit of time, I can go back to the program screen, and there we go, I got all my code, my information. If there's a tool change required, it'll probe the tool before it runs this pass. And then as it's running, it'll tell me what percentage the uh, operation is complete. And it will show me roughly what it's doing over here. So that's pretty nice. It's very simple. It's similar in a lot of ways to Mark III. It's just much more refined as it's running. It'll tell you what its current feed rate is, what the current tool it's running is, how fast your spindle is moving, just some basic information, just so you're aware of what's going on. The graphic over here, it's got an option for depth map. And it'll kind of show you what these lines look like as they refer to the z-axis travel. So this is sort of a topographical surface. So if I go from 2D, we just see a collection of lines. If I go to 3D, you can see it's showing me that some of those are a lot deeper. There's a lot of overlap going on where it's hogging out more material as it's plugging through those, uh, those Z moves. As far as your tools are concerned, under the F4 tab here, this is where it's gonna store all those offsets for the tools you use. You may have it set to probe the tool every time. That's what we do because we're doing manual tool changes. There's no consistency in that tool height. So it's gonna probe it every time. When it goes and probes it, it recognizes there's a list of tool numbers here. When it goes and probes the new tool, it will save that Z offset and use it for that entire cut. And then when you switch back, it's going to reprobe, so it's not gonna be an issue. This value is not gonna live in here forever. Unless you're using an automatic tool changer, you could set it that it's just going to assume a certain height for that tool every single time. The last tab we haven't really explored here, I've never used this conversational tab, the F1. So this is the setup for the machine. So this is where you're gonna enter in all the parameters for the machine. It's sort of a set and forget. You're probably only gonna do it once. You're gonna tell it what your inputs and outputs are assigned to. You're gonna tell it what the pulse rate of your drivers are, the travel distance per revolution in the motor, all that critical data that you need to set up based on your specific build. That's all gonna be in here. So in the center panel here, we have all the inputs and the states of those inputs. 
and on the right hand side we have all the outputs. So this is just where you're gonna assign what any one of those outputs, we have 18 of them available, what they're doing if they're connected back to a relay block and powering a certain function that the machine needs to know is there, such as a coolant system or a lubrication system. This is where you're gonna assign all those outputs. So you can see you have quite a few options, 18 outputs and a ton of inputs. So we have sort of our standard inputs and then we have 24 other individual inputs, ton of expandability. So as an all-in-one package, I highly recommend it. Compared to a PC setup with Mach 3, it has a number of advantages. Number one, the cost is not all that much more significant when you factor in the cost of a PC, the cost of a Mach 3 license, the cost of a controller and a breakout board and all that other stuff that this essentially replaces. I also find it much easier to use the Mach 3. Obviously, maybe that's not a good comparison. It's a little clunky, but everything is laid out in a way that's very intuitive. You can flip between your screens, everything from the setup screen, your jog screen, your program screen. It's just a touch away. It's just laid out a lot better. I feel like Mach 3 gives you a lot of information you don't need to know on a regular basis. They've done a good job of just simplifying the information that's relevant when you're performing a task. So I really do like that. As far as learning this for a novice user, I would say it's much easier to do. There isn't as much of a learning curve. It's just like using any other well laid out piece of software, especially with this touchscreen interface. We've started using these controllers on all our machines just for continuity across the board. They're very capable. They could run a three axis machine or a five axis machine and the interface and the way it works is always gonna be the same. We just plug our code in with a USB drive. You can load it. The startup times are great. When you fire up the machine, it's ready to rock in about 10 seconds compared to possibly minutes with a PC setup. PCs can also be inherently a little bit unstable. If something else pops up, if you're running your Mach 3, you're halfway through a cut, and your antivirus decides it's gonna interrupt with a scan or decide to do a restart, you're gonna crash that whole system and even little things that people expressed were concerning, such as the functionality of the touchscreen, I can assert that it's great. It works whether it's dirty, if you have grease on your hands, none of that seems to be a problem. A few other small gripes of this controller just revolve around the software itself. We have had a crash on occasion, not very often, but it does happen. The MesoLink software that you can use to wirelessly transfer files to the controller doesn't always work that well. And there are some quirks in the actual operation of it. Sometimes we find that it just isn't doing what we want it to do and you kind of got to click one thing, click back. and. It's again, it's not something that happens very often, but it definitely still has some minor usability issues that will probably eventually be worked out in future software updates. You also can integrate a keyboard and mouse setup if you just don't want to use the touchscreen. You can orient this however you want. We have it in portrait, you could set up for landscape, and then you can use it with a mouse and a keyboard. And you still have this sort of nicely laid out system without having to use the touchscreen itself. The fact that everything is integrated nicely in the back is also awesome. It makes diagnostics a little bit easier. If you're just probing things, everything's right there. You don't kind of have three different layers of electrical system that you're chasing through. You know, you might have some in your computer. You might have some inside the machine itself. The expandability is great. As you can see, we're not using a lot of the inputs and outputs on this. We could add a ton of equipment from tool changers or a couple extra axes if we wanted to go to like a five axis setup. The supplier, Meso themselves, seem to be very set on improving the interface. They have updates all the time. They have great customer service. So it's definitely the kind of company that it's worth getting involved with. Uh, they're there to help you out and they're constantly improving their product.